My name is Taryn Hart, and I'm with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. Uh, my name is Spencer Mills, uh, Oak for Show on Twitter, and we have a new website, oakforshow.com, O-A-K-F-O-S-H-O.com. Great. And uh, Ustream, or is that, or is it now on your site? It's, uh, you can get the Ustream on the front page of the site. It's embedded there, but it's ustream.tv slash Occupy Oakland. Great. So I guess we'll just start with, for those of you, uh, for the, those of our viewers not familiar with you yet, um, just with how you got involved with the Occupy movement and then also how you got started streaming. Uh, well, I got involved with the Occupy movement here in Oakland pretty early on. There were a couple of um, pre-Oscar Grant Plaza meetings, and Oscar Grant Plaza was the place where our first camp was set up here in downtown Oakland. Uh, there was a rally about a week before and a couple of meetings uh, before that, uh, and I showed up and was just kind of in the background um, just basically as a protester and someone that's kind of uh, disappointed in how the system's working. Uh, and that's how I got involved in the Occupy protests as a whole. Uh, I started streaming on the, on the day of the general strike here in Oakland. It was November 2nd. Right. Um, yeah, somebody told me, hey, you have a smartphone. You have, I have a Droid X. You can download this Ustream app, and uh, you can start streaming. And so I did. Just started that day. And yeah, I just uh, did you get viewers on. right away? I actually, I wish I'd have found you that day. I was looking for somebody who was, you know, it, I was, it was, uh, you know, a shift at that point. I think um, from New York exclusively to a lot of other occupations. Oakland was really the first occupation outside of New York, I think, to get a lot of national attention because of the raids. Right. I think um, I. I I don't know. I, I had a maybe twenty five hundred followers on Twitter um, when okay. when this started. I'd been on Twitter since uh, the Iran uprising in two thousand and eight, uh, and I cover uh, covered other events here in Oakland uh, like Oscar Grant, uh, but never with live video. Uh, and I had been I had been YouTube video like YouTubing uh, for a little while, uh, like a couple of weeks I guess. I'd been posting YouTube videos, and so I had some. Some people on Twitter that immediately were interested in watching, mm -hmm. um, and maybe I had a few hundred viewers uh, to start, but, you know, it, it, that night is when it really blew up. Um, after after the police came and uh, started to ki and kick people out of a foreclosed building, uh, and all the mainstream media left after their 12 o'clock broadcast, I was pretty much the only guy left there, except for one guy from, uh, I think it was like some Spanish news network from Southern California. <laughs> it's kind of a solo run operation, and he's always there. I've got a lot of respect for him. I forget what his news his news station is, but he's always there. We'll find him uh, and link. We'll make sure to link him. Yeah, I was the only I was the only live stream there though, and so we ended up along with on my stream page and then on global global revolution on on live stream also mirrors my stream a lot of times. Right. Combine those two streams alone at, at any given time we were between ten and fifteen thousand viewers. Which puts us kind of on the on the level of like a small cable TV show, right? Uh, which I mean, for a first evening's broadcast was was pretty Amazing. good. Amazing, right? Right, yeah. I mean that, and that's what you know. Somebody was just saying I interviewed Jatau, uh, Punk Boy, and SF. You guys do a lot of stuff kind of together, both there in the Bay Area, and I know you went to Occupy LA eviction together. Um, and you know that's what he was saying is you know it takes one big night you know, one event where you get picked up by Global Revolution or whatever and it explodes. Yeah, I think um, I think being the only source and then doing, I guess, an okay job being the only source right. um, kind of makes you, uh, it just, it, it makes, it kind of makes you uh, avail. I don't know if available is the right word. It makes you kind of a trusted resource, right. I think. Uh, what I did, you know, I was clearly by like, I don't, I don't, I, I editorialize a lot, basically, right. you know, I have my own views, right. I have my bias uh, towards this whole thing. I like to think that my bias is, is something that the vast majority of people agree with. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I definitely am opinionated and have views. I'm not like a standoff journalist that's going to give, it's going to give uh, a totally neutral view of things. Uh, but yeah, it only takes really one big event where you are the the sole source or one of the only sources that people can get to uh, for for it to blow up. Right. 
Um, well, since you since you brought that up, I did want to get into it a little bit. Uh, it's it's good to hear that you know. I think it's good to hear. I think there's been a in the mainstream media this kind of faux objectivity um, that I think is is good to get rid of. You know, where what they do is in the name of being objective represent both sides of the argument is essentially all they're trying to do and like for for example the obama birth certificate debate yes or like, global warming or right right um things that you know aren't objective in a scientific sense um i mean the days the days of walter cronkite are over Right. The days of guys getting on the news and reporting facts and leaving it up to the viewers to interpret what that means, it's over. Uh, you, the, you know, the gold standard of journalism is still 60 minutes, in my opinion, but there's only one 60 minutes. The rest of it is just uh, a bunch of people, you know, spinning things based on their corporate sponsorship, like right. whether, whether it be GE with MSNBC or CNN with uh, Bank of America or Fox News with all their different corporate sponsors. It doesn't really matter. They're all beholden to their corporate sponsors and they're all, they're all going to adjust what they report and how they report based on that sponsorship. And so the, the, the days of unbiased news are pretty much dead, right. in my opinion. Right, except there is something, I mean, actually, um, the, and, and I'm not going to remember his last name, but Vlad of Global Revolution, um, or I'm not going to be able to pronounce his last name, uh, but he's pretty well known by this point, you know, said, you know, there's no ability for us to edit this as it's happening. So, I mean, this really is just being presented. I mean, there there is what you film and where you put your camera, and yes, there is editorializing, but the ca there, there's no ability to edit. The footage itself is pure. Right. The footage itself is very pure, and, and as long as there are some people out there that get disappointed with the fact that I'm highly critical sometimes. Um, like in, in, you know, I'm highly critical of my own movement here in Oakland especially because I think as an Occupy Oaklander, I think it's very important that we have, number one, uh, diversity of views, and number, number two, uh, dissent. We have to have dissent uh, for this democracy to be strong. And one of the big areas of, uh, that I'm very critical here in Oakland is uh, what's called uh, the diversity of tactics versus nonviolence debate here in right. Oakland. Uh, and I, you know, I'm what I describe as viciously nonviolent. Uh, I will be nonviolent to the end. I don't believe I don't believe any any violence like breaking a window is violence. Hurting someone is violence, but so is foreclosing on someone in the middle of winter uh, when you don't have the proper paperwork. It's all violence on different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and, and some people say, well, how can we be nonviolent when all this violence is occurring to our community? And I said, well, two wrongs don't make a right. Mm -hmm. um, you can't, you can't uh, equate, you can't equate these level of violence, but you can't also justify even a small level of violence because of the great level of violence that's coming down on the American people by the 1% uh, or the world. Uh, that's coming down, you know, I mean, we, we're dropping bombs on countries right now all over the place where we're breaking international law uh, every single day and nobody seems to really care about it, um, you know, and, and this, this, but at the same time, I don't think that we can respond to this violence with violence in itself. So I'm highly critical uh, of that in my own movement here in Oakland. And uh, while I do participate in GAs and while I do consider myself an Occupy Oaklander, I can't, I can't literally join the structure of the movement here in Oakland. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't participate in say media meetings or, um, facilitation meetings, things like that. I feel like I cannot participate until the movement embraces nonviolence. I can't become necessarily an integral part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I do is, is autonomous guerrilla media. And I, I tell my, I tell everybody, Hey, I'm an Occupy Oaklander and I am Occupy Oakland media, but I'm my own Occupy Oakland media mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. I, I was going to bring it up. There was kind of a that issue and another issue, which I saw you were talking to people on Twitter about last night of transparency, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the the I think that a lot of people aren't aware. I know people aren't aware here in my own occupation. Um, diversity of tactics is a kind of code phrase that is used 
uh, to say we're going to respect diversity of tactics to make room for things that aren't necessarily nonviolent, that embrace things like vandalism, et cetera. And so there have been issues both in New York and in Oakland um, about whether to officially adopt nonviolence or to respect a quote unquote diversity of tactics. And my understanding is that officially so far, both Oakland and New York have officially maintained a, a diversity of tactics position. Although Nathan Schneider wrote a piece about the fact that New York has really, um, if not in words, if not explicitly said we're nonviolent have in many, many, many other ways um, embraced nonviolence. So. You see, if it were me, if it, if it were me, I, I had actually heard that they had actually adopted a proposal on nonviolence in New York, and mm. I could be I could uh, be wrong then. I know early on, and I'm referring to a specific Nathan Schneider piece, but maybe they have, and I'm misinformed. I hope they have. I know a lot of people around the country have uh, different different My occupies. My occupation has. I think it's uh, I think it's critical. I think if you want to build mass support for the movement uh, around the country, I think nonviolence is absolutely key right. um, to that. Right. Absolutely, I agree, and also makes us less vulnerable to infiltration. I mean, I think that there's two keys to not being violent, not being um, infiltrated or vulnerable to agent provocateurs, and this is the other issue, and one is to adopt nonviolence and be disciplined about remaining nonviolent, and the other is transparency. Um, and so, and I think that you'll hear uh, criticism against transparency from the same groups who support diversity of tactics. Um, you know, you saw that with the Tim Pool uh, video of the um, eviction of Zuccotti, uh, where he stumbled across um, a group of people who were letting air out of police tires and they were trying to get him to quit filming, and he refused. Um, in the so name that's of, actually, go on. That's actually one instance. Um, there are certain things that I think are very clever uh, mm -hmm. that I consider nonviolent. Mm -hmm. um, like for for instance, recently in San Francisco, uh, the police put up barricades uh, around around their park. Now, around they left the barricades out there for probably a week or two. Right. Just stacked in corners. <laughs> right. Now, I, w I would not personally consider it violent to, say, take 40 U-locks and just happen to U-lock those together right. to, make them, to make them a little more difficult to, to get apart. They would have to bring in, you know, some kind of cutters or whatnot right. just to slow them down. I think so long as the property itself is not damaged, mm -hmm. uh, you can come up with innovative, creative, nonviolent ways to prove a point and to slow the and to slow the actions of police now right so like letting air out of tires which doesn't actually damage the tires but the issue there was actually to whether to film that okay. was the issue that was happening there it was a transparency issue um, and he and he took a very strong line and said no transparency is a principle of solidarity and I'm not going to stop filming totally and is that your position as well that you film totally uh, yeah. Number one, if you're doing something at an official, like, uh, what I always say is if it's official, I can film it. If you're going to broadcast, like, number one, if you're at a GA and you speak at a GA and you don't want to be filmed, well, you shouldn't be at the GA speaking. Uh, right. that's a, that's a public forum. That is, uh, that is democracy in action and it should be transparent as transparent gets. Um, if it's an officially sponsored rally or event, uh, and you're there, um, I I'm going to film that event. So if you're going to be a major part of it, expect to get on film. Expect to be on camera and and adjust your actions accordingly. Now, if I'm out on the street and I come across you and you say, well, I don't want to be on camera, I don't want to be interviewed, okay, I'm not going to put my camera in your face. Right. But if, if you're an officially a sponsored event or um, something that's advertised by the movement is, hey, we're going to march here and we're going to help save this foreclosed home here or we're going to we're going to do this then i'm going to show up and i'm going to film it and people call me and tell me hey show up at this time and film here um mm -hmm. that's that's to me on the filming side on the video side what transparency is all about 
Now, if you don't, if it's like kind of uh, covert action and and we're trying to uh, keep it from the authorities, not necessarily because it's illegal, but because we know the authorities would try and disrupt it in any way possible that they could, right. then that's a different story. Uh, but if it's an official event that you throw out on the website or do something with, then I'm going to show up and I'm going to film it. Mm-hmm. And aren't going to stop filming because people tell you to stop filming. Not at all. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was his position as well. Um so very interesting, um, you know, ideas with that stuff. Although, and I know he has, so your position, the reason that you're not participating officially with Occupy Oakland is, is doesn't have to do with your journalism. It has to do with the non, the fact that you want them to adopt nonviolence. Correct. Um, okay. it's not, and it's not that I don't participate. I still show, like at GAs that I can make it to. I still show up and I vote. Mm-hmm. Um, I still participate in that way. I cannot just become an official part of the apparatus. I'll say of the Occupy movement here in Oakland. Uh, I can't officially become a team member. Now I'm in contact with them, and we do talk. Uh, but I don't show up and I don't vote at media meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, I, like that's pretty much where I fit in is is at media, of course. But I don't show up and vote at media meetings. I don't participate in that in that bureaucracy because um i don't feel i don't feel right about it uh because if we vote on something and then we go and we cover it or whatnot and violent things happen there that we haven't necessarily endorsed but we haven't necessarily excluded uh that i i would feel a part of that right and i don't want to feel a part of something that uh is anything other than nonviolent. right yeah our um ga adopted it at the very first meeting and within like 10 minutes. And I was, I was really glad because I think now seeing how difficult the consensus process could be, getting that done first and up front was a really, like if anybody's looking to start an occupation, do that right away. That would be my advice. We have, uh, we have some really diverse interests here in Oakland. Uh, And if you know anything about the history of Oakland, I mean, from the Panther movement uh, and so on and so forth. It's kind of uh, we have a lot of folks that are explicitly against uh, nonviolence, and it's kind of frustrating. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, dissent is what democracy is all about, and they're entitled to their opinion. And and uh, while I disagree with them, I also appreciate them at the same time, uh, though we do disagree wholeheartedly on these issues. Right to the point where you won't officially participate. Right. Well, again, I, I, I participate in GAs. Right. Or won't, offic- won't be part of the apparatus. Correct, correct. Right, won't officially be part of the apparatus. I, I will uh, continue to be autonomous guerrilla media. Uh, autonomous to the end. autonomous <laughs> guerrilla media, that's a great <laughs> phrase. I like it. Um, okay, so November 2nd was your first streaming event, although you had, had you been live tweeting and... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. And had a following from that. And then um, what were the events? So what have you covered since then? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> GAs, rallies, marches, uh, a couple of more raids in Oakland, um, raids that weren't in San Francisco. Right. Uh, partial raids in San Francisco. Right. Uh, and of course, the raid in LA. Uh, we went. We went down last week. We arrived at twelve oh one a.m. on Monday. Uh, what was that? Monday? I think the twenty seventh or the twenty eighth of November. Uh, and yeah, we, uh, we that was when their deadline to evict was. Uh, so we showed up, and that night, police. Ironically, in the end, because the, all the Occupy LAers began marching in the streets, the police ironically asked them to return to camp at the end of the night. Uh, the oh. same camp they were supposed to be evicted from, and those that didn't return to camp were kind of booted from the streets with, by a few hundred officers. And then uh, two nights later, they came in with 1,400 officers and cleared that camp, uh, and we were there uh, to cover that. Uh, and then the next day we came home, and I've kind of been laid up sick ever since. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping to get better. Uh, and then the next big the next big event, of course, is the December 12th uh, West Coast Port Shutdown. Yep. Uh, I think uh, I'm the, really excited for it. Looks like it's going to be amazing. You're going to cover it in Oakland. It, it, absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, I think myself and Punk Boy will be here in, in the Bay Area. 
Right. Uh, and then uh, I think we discussed Tim Pool a little bit ago. He uh, he apparently is going to be flying to L.A. to cover to cover actions in Southern California as well. Oh, great! And then Occupy Freedom L.A. I'm sure will be streaming. For sure. Streaming. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and then, but yeah, there's there. We should try to figure out where all the streams are going to be because there's Seattle, there's Portland, there's San Diego. Um, we should get a lock on all those streams before the. 12th comes down, I'll work on doing that. Um, yeah, I watched, the first time I watched you was with the Occupy LA raid, and I watched you until it was done, um, until the early morning hours when they took the people out of the trees, <laughs> which was... <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. See, I didn't know that they were actually going to be able to get people out of the trees because in Oakland, uh, and of course, I, I don't know if you've heard of the Berkeley tree sitters, um, Cal a little. Ber this is the so, second time I've heard about them, but go on. So Cal Berkeley, uh, they wanted to build a new new football facilities and everything, and in order to do that, they had to tear down just, like, ancient trees. Right. Uh, and so right. the There's these amazing redwoods. I mean, I'm from Northern California, so, yeah. Right. And so uh, a bunch of people, uh, to include original Native peoples like the Ohlone people uh, that were original Native peoples from this area, Basically climbed up in the trees and, and inhabited them, uh, right. like like took them over and lived in them for over a year. Uh, it was really, I mean, it was really quite impressive uh, that right. they stayed up there for so long uh, in protest. And yeah, I think I just tried, and this is the second time I've heard about it because the first time I heard about it, I think there's somebody who is I want to say John Friesen, who's very involved in New York um, and has and is doing some video over there. Um, and a lot with Chris Hedges, who I think was a tree sitter. So okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the individuals that was part of that tree sitting uh, we, protest, the year long yeah. <laughs> protest, uh, actually is, is sitting in a tree in Oakland right now. Okay. Uh, he came over, and there's um, there's a group of trees that line Oscar Grant Plaza, and he just. Climbed up one of them with all this gear one day, and he's been up there. And uh, he's come down a couple of times in Occupy Oaklanders have gone up and sat in the tree in his place. Uh, and so, though they kicked us out of Oscar Grant Plaza, Oscar Grant Plaza is still technically occupied uh, and will remain so, so long as somebody's up in that tree or up in multiple trees. I think there are actually plans uh, for people to start getting in other trees as well. Um, and because uh, the city... I don't think legally knows how to deal with it because I don't think the fire department can be used in an offensive action uh, like the police can. Okay. And so in L.A., they didn't use the fire department. They brought in SWAT vehicles and and uh, something called the Bear Cat, Bat Cat or whatever it was. Right. It was like an elevated platform vehicle that they brought in and they just cleared people out of the trees. I didn't know. I didn't actually know that that was legally feasible, but they, they went ahead and did it. Uh, we'll see if anything happens in court as a result of that, but we'll see. Yeah, I tried to get the video I wanted from you, and I still haven't been able to find, is you first, you talk to um, the police captain there that you seem to have a pretty good relationship with in L.A. And that's another thing. Like, when you say you editorialize, like, one of the things you said in L.A. was how good of a job they did compared with what happened in Oakland. So comparatively speaking, uh, they were right. they Better. were step a step above OPD professionally and legally. Uh, number one, every officer's badge and name tag was showing every single one, um, which was which was a complete a complete one eighty from what what we've had here in Oakland. Had, they've had them covered. Oh, absolutely! I'd say the vast majority, especially in the early raids, uh, there were no names, no badge numbers. It was all wow. covered up with with black padding. I mean, they all just basically looked like Robocops coming in and they all had their gas masks on and you really couldn't tell who any individual was, um, which I think also provided them the anonymity to do greater, greater violence right. uh, than, than they otherwise would have been able to do. Right. They don't have the uh, accountability. Right. So there were some instances after the fact that I heard about uh, that I was highly disappointed with as far as LAPD was concerned. Yeah. And also later on in the evening when they when they took down the last treehouse, uh, they unloaded four rounds. Right. Uh, no, I watched it on your stream. Yeah, I stayed until you quit streaming. 
you kind of so quit the, streaming and then came across, and then it, right. you know, yeah. I thought it was all said and done for the evening. I didn't know I was going to be able to get back into the park. Right. And uh, then I just kind of uh, went back in, and they, you know, I was just hanging out with the regular media folks, and again, I have a kind of like a little homemade press badge, and so it kind of works. <laughs> right. Uh, so I got back in, and I started streaming again, um, and they... There were several instances throughout the night that I would say I was highly disappointed in LAPD with. Uh, number one, um, they came in and they did happen to slam several people to the ground unnecessarily. Uh, they did, at one point in the evening, I personally had a, a shotgun pointed at my head. Uh, right, right. Was- and that's an amazing moment that, that um, I think was on um, RT and... And what was so amazing about it is that you called them on it immediately. Immediately. And immediately. And we're saying, you know, that's not procedure. You can't do that. Don't point your weapon at me. And um, he, he looked at me and he said, well, don't worry about it. It's only a flashlight. Well, the thing is, is your flashlight is attached to the end of your shotgun. Uh, right. And your, and your, your shotgun is, is, you know, securely, securely holstered to your shoulder. And right. you're, you're aiming it around at, at different protesters. And then right. you point, I'm sitting, I'm standing there filming with my camera like this, and he just points it directly at my head. Right. Uh, and it was, you know, he aims up at a tree, and then he just comes down on my head for, you know, it wasn't that long. But right. when you when you have a shotgun pointed at your head, it feels like an eternity. Right. Uh, and so when he took it down, I just basically, you know, uh, very, very loudly, I told him that it was unacceptable. Uh, right. And, you know, I'm, I'm personally working on filing a complaint right now. I've called in and left oh. a message with Internal Affairs, uh, and hopefully they'll get back to me. If they don't get back to me, I intend on filing um, a, compl- a complaint manually uh, through the mail. And uh, I have a friend of mine down there. Uh, he runs the Brad blog uh, on Twitter. Yep. Uh, he has his own public radio show, and he's done some inquiries to LAPD. So slowly but surely, hopefully we'll – We'll find an answer as to whether or not um, LAPD condones such such action. Um, but okay, so that's number one. You were disappointed in that. You were disappointed in some violent takedowns. Right, and then uh, and then I was disappointed that they had to uh, use less than lethal shotgun shotgun bean bags on individuals in the final treehouse. Right. Uh, but for the most part. You know, and apparently there were other incidents that I didn't see uh, that people are talking about. But you know, especially after after people were arrested, uh, they were left in uh, they were left in like small cells on the bus for something like seven or eight hours. Many of them without without food, without water. Some of whom had had experienced um, less than lethals uh, and were uh, and were not provided medical care. Um, you know, those uh, those what do you call them, zip tie wristbands that they use um, can also, you know, do a lot of nerve damage and cut off circulation if they're not applied, applied properly. And, uh, you know, a lot of them, a lot of protesters are still complaining days later of not having feeling in their hands. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things like you, you know, I think OPD would have probably done much, much worse. But, uh, you know, right. I, I, can't say, I can't say I was happy with everything that LAPD did. Right, right. But you didn't have the tear gas and the, Correct. right, I mean. The, and, and the widespread and, use of flashbangs and everything else. Right, and you did mention that. So yeah. your editorializing doesn't, has been, I think, even-handed from what I've seen. Um, so the moment that I was looking for um, was, okay, so you originally talked to the captain, is it Smith, I think? Uh, Commander Smith. Commander, Commander Smith. Smith. He's like the... The liaison, I guess, he would always come out. The, the days that I was there, he was out every day talking to protesters. He would come through the camp. Uh, he would talk to the to the different leaders around the camp. Uh, he was always, you know, free, free and forthcoming with information. Uh, and I used him as a great example because I know OPD watches my stream. Um, it's a I'm always, you know, around for important events, and they always watch my stream apparently, and so. Um, I'm sure they were probably watching that night, and I made a I made a point to to point out Commander Smith's actions. And though I might disagree with the premise of of what he's doing or what they do, the fact that he did it in a professional way, the fact that he was open and forthcoming, the fact that he came through and talked to people uh, was 
kind of refreshing in that sense. Right, particularly coming from Oakland and Alameda County. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Right, right. Who we've seen their handiwork in at Berkeley and in Oakland and all over. I mean, Berkeley police, Berkeley police themselves wouldn't go to Cal, uh, which is Cal Berkeley. Uh, right. But Oakland police, you know, is rushed over at the, you know, at the thought, and, and so did Alameda County. Um, but even Berkeley police wouldn't show up because uh, they disagreed. I, I assume because they they saw what happened previously at, at previous raids and didn't want any part of it. Right. So okay. So um, yeah. So you saw you talked to Commander Smith and you said you know can I get in and see the camp like right after it had been torn down and when you went in that first time you said oh there's people in the trees they're in the trees and you could hear them yelling. And they were citing code and saying, I've always wanted to live in a tree house. And then I think you came out and then went back when and when they took the tree people out. I right, was looking- so I didn't know that they were going to be able to get them out of that tree. Uh, right. I didn't think they were going to actually be able to get them out of that. Like, they got them out of other trees, but that one was like this massive tree house up between <laughs> four right. palm trees. And I didn't think they were going to be able to get them out. And apparently the tree, the tree house itself is still standing, uh, but... Yeah, so I was walking out of the park and I was kind of uh, liberating a few items uh, uh, that right? I right. You tried to get a sign, I remember. Yeah, yeah I, actually, I actually did. Uh, you get did. A sign. It's hanging right over here. I'll, I'll I'll go get it before the end of the interview. But, yes, do I want to see it? Uh, I got one sign from the from the welcome tent uh, that I liberated. It just basically says, "We are occupying Los Angeles." Yeah, uh, yeah. I saw then, you posted it on Twitter. Right, and yeah. and so. You know, I was trying to liberate a couple of other signs that, that throughout the previous days I had really liked. Yeah. Uh, the SWAT guys are the Metro guys that rolled up in a SWAT vehicle. Uh, I guess they borrowed it from SWAT, but they rolled up in that bat cat thing uh, that they got people out of the trees with. Where As they were rolling by, they were like, hey, get out of the park. Don't touch that, this and that. And I recognized that they were – and I was like, okay – and then I just followed them, and they were like, get out of the park. And I was like, no, I'm allowed to be here. Uh, I'm press. I'm going to film what you guys are about to do. Um, and Commander Smith was right there. And then I walked right back up the steps by the treehouse and just watched them, started filming again and watched that unfold. Yeah. Yeah, it was really quite amazing. But, yeah, I wanted to find that first clip, the one where you first saw the tree people before, long before, I feel like, you know, an hour or so before they brought the equipment in to extract them. Do you know what I'm talking, do you know which clip I'm talking about? So it's the one where the guy's there with the crown and he's... Totally, totally. <laughs> I walked right up below the treehouse and I pointed my, right. my my phone right up there and he talked down he, to it. They it were citing on, code. It should be on Ustream. I'll, I'll okay. check it for okay. you later. I really want that clip. It was, and you were laughing and it was really late at night. Okay, so the other thing that happened during that time is by that time... You had gone through all your batteries and you're just streaming with your phone. Like you had sophisticated camera stuff that you were using earlier in the night, but you'd gone through everything and now you're just streaming on your phone because it's like five in the morning or something. I right. Think. And um, so at one point you had to put down you had to put down something to do something, and and you so the phone camera was pointed up at you and I could see you were wearing like you had a gas mask. Oh yeah. Around your neck. Like a, yeah. like a military style gas mask. No doubt, no doubt. Do you take those? Is that standard? How many times have it's you? A lot been- of press with it. Well, especially here in Oakland, all the photogs uh, with experience had gas masks. Um, you know, it was it was it was donated to me on uh, on the second raid here in Oakland. Somebody just came up to me. He's like, "Hey, you're Oak for show," and I said, "Yeah." And he's like, "Here, have this gas mask." And right. so I've had it ever since. Um, and other people have, you know, donated me filters and things like that, um, for different, like some filters are only good for tear gas. Some are good for pepper spray. Recently, a guy got me one that was good for all of it. Um, so yeah, I brought that with me just in case. Uh, and I had that, I had that around my neck all all night and I, you know, whenever I'm in that kind of a situation, I always try to have it with me. So, so it is common. The journalists that you see around these raids have them. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, in Oakland, especially, I didn't really see very many <laughs> Which in LA. Speaks to Oakland, right? <laughs> right. And I didn't really see very many in LA. I think I was one of the only ones, except for protesters had them. But I think I was one of the only ones in LA. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, it's just it's it's kind of a necessity 
to have uh, after the first couple of raids in Oakland. I'm running through class, clouds of tear gas with my phone, and the first couple of times I'm after the night Scott Olson got shot, I wasn't streaming, uh, right. but I, I took YouTube videos, and on the YouTube videos, I'm running through clouds of tear gas and coughing, and uh, yeah, it's just it was really not good. I was actually in my work slacks, uh, you know, because I was still working at the gym at the time, and um, I'm in work slacks and a collar, and I'm running through clouds of tear gas. Uh, and, yeah, so I didn't want to do that anymore because it sucks. Right. Uh, it sucks to be tear gassed, and it sucks to have to go back. But one thing I do always say is um, what I remember most about the nights where we were tear gassed here in Oakland is not necessarily the tear gas itself, but the individuals afterwards that ran up to me with, like, Maalox spray on um, things like that and, like, came up to me with, with help and encouragement um, and medical treatment, essentially, the, the Occupy Oakland medics uh, and just and just other Occupy Oaklanders that, that came up and helped and were helping other people. That's what I remember. It was like a level of love and compassion between protesters uh, and those civilians that were just there. I mean, the first rounds of tear gas in Oakland happened with disabled, uh, elderly, children, whole families present. Uh, and it was uncalled for, and it was unnecessary. Uh, and those people were helped by other Oaklanders. They weren't helped by professionals. They were helped by other Oaklanders that were out there and had the right um, had the right materials to do so. Right. Yeah. So how many how many tear uh, tear gas incidents have you been present for? Oh, I think I've probably been through like six or seven rounds of tear gas. Um, you know, it's, oh it's, my God. it's, it's, uh, and I all haven't, in Oakland? I, all in Oakland, it was those first, it was the, the, the first two night, it was, well, the first day, essentially that, that first night. And then, uh, the, the night that Scott Olson, uh, was hit in the head, uh, was, right. so there's, yeah. right. Cause so there was the raid and then there the was, next day there was a protest of the raid, which is when Scott Olson, raided. right. And, of course, the night of the general strike, there was also tear gas and flashbang flashbangs used. Right, right, yeah. And New York's had a lot of. Well, I mean, I know certainly at the Zuccotti raid, they had tear gas, and you know they've had numerous pepper spray incidents. I think uh, I think they're kind of. I think different police agencies around the country have learned from Oakland. Pepper uh, tear gas itself is is not really uh, aimed. It just explodes and the gas goes where the wind goes. Pepper spray uh, and things like that is more targeted. And so a lot of them are kind of rethinking their use on these things, on these riot control measures. And I think a lot of them are trying to use pepper spray, targeted, streamed pepper spray more often than they are uh, than they are tear gas now. And you've seen, you saw Davis, uh, that cop, you know, that's now become like one of the most famous memes of all time, uh, yeah. where he's. He's just running around, just uh, just pepper spraying all these protesters as they're sitting down on the ground. Uh, I think that's kind of, you know, but the, all the people around aren't really getting the effects, essentially. Uh, whereas if he were to just drop a tear gas canister, everybody in that square would have Clear out. It. Right. Correct. And you can see that in the Scott Olson video when the second tear gas, when people were trying to help him. And the, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, I mean, I saw the, the, video the youtube the first youtube video that got posted where scott olson was injured and i couldn't believe it was the united states seeing that kind of a scene you know i mean it reminded me it reminds me of scenes from you know the middle east or you know some it's just insane that that's happening domestically the helicopter, Im is, the helicopter image is looking down and just seeing explosions all over the place tear gas yes. all over the place were intense uh in being on the ground you know it's it's after the first few you're just kind of uh backpedaling or jogging in the other direction uh and of course early on i was i was kind of not very smart and so i would i would get a, get away like 20 feet and i would turn around and i would keep the camera going uh but you can't really see you know you can't really see a lot of the tear gas that's coming at you it just kind of happens and then all of a sudden you're exposed and your eyes and your and your throat and, and your, you know, passageways are just like burning. Um, but I learned, you know, now that I have a gas mask, I think I've learned my lesson. Uh, and I, you know, I would like to be able to just stand there and film. And now I will be able to uh, with my gas mask. Yeah. 
So, okay, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Oakland, just because I remember the very first thing I ever heard about Oakland, and it was pretty early on, and it was before any of the evictions. This is back when, like, you know, Mayor Kwan was marching with the, with you guys, and um, before there was any of that stuff. And I remember Naomi Klein. Old, what's that? The good old days when Mayor yes. Kwan was really an activist. Yes. And I remember um, Naomi Klein came and she went to Occupy San Francisco and then she went to Occupy Oakland and she said, Occupy Oakland is amazing. And that was, everybody reacted that way in terms of just the, you know, that, you know, the services that were there, the childcare and the teach-ins and the, you know, how good the kitchen was and how, I mean, everything about it, people were just outsiders that came and visited were immediately blown away by Oakland. Kitchen itself, uh, tens of thousands of meals. Uh, the health department would come in and give it like a, a B plus rating, which in the middle of a of an open air park, uh, feeding tens of thousands of people uh, is is pretty ridiculous. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a great thing. Uh, it's like my favorite part about all of Occupy Oakland so far was that kitchen, and I actually know the guy. Uh, his name is Matt. He, it was kind of his pet project, and um, he's probably one of the people that I have the most respect for uh, at Occupy Oakland because he, what he did really, really made a difference. I mean, he fed, he, we provided services at Occupy Oakland uh, early on that the city never provided. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, w- <sighs> Kaplan, um, Rebecca Kaplan, she's a, she ran for mayor against Jean Kwan and against uh, Dom Parada. Uh, actually, I think she ended up in second place in the end. Um, but she she came out and she asked us, "Hey, what do you need? Uh, what do, What do you guys need?" And uh, we responded, "We need uh, mental health services because a lot of the homeless population wasn't receiving the care that they needed, and a lot of them were homeless because they had mental health issues uh, that right, didn't allow right. them to hold down a job." Uh, that you know, that didn't allow them to take care of themselves without proper treatment, uh, and so we said, "Hey, we need mental health services." And there was a homicide on the outskirts of Occupy Oakland that took place. Um, that was a direct result of lack of mental health services, and um, you know, we never got any response from Kaplan or the rest of City Council. We never, uh, we never received the help that was promised to us, uh, and as a result, I, I feel like that that murder could have been avoided. Um, it happened because. Uh, a homeless man uh, who was, I, I believe, schizophrenic and also uh, a, abusing drugs uh, happened to get into an altercation with uh, a youngster from Oakland. That youngster lost the altercation uh, and, as a result, called his friends in. His friends came in. They had another altercation. That was broken up. And then they found somebody else to get into a fight with uh, on the other side of the plaza as a group. Uh, that was broken up, and then they met up again, and a gun was pulled, shots were fired, and somebody ended up dead. All that started uh, with a with a minor altercation between uh, a man that clearly needed help uh, and a youngster that, that, that clearly uh, never received the guidance uh, or the education or uh, the necessary parenting uh, that he probably deserved growing up. Uh, and I think it's all kind of... For me, it all just kind of leads back to the fact that we spend over 50% of our budget on Oakland police, when in reality, if we took 20% of that away and spent it on services like mental health services, like programs for youth to get them away from gang violence, to get them proper educations, uh, you know, to, to do, to do what is necessary for our community, a lot of the violence in our community could be avoided and OPD wouldn't be as necessary. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, for me, it's kind of like a vicious circle. We invest in violence, in the violence of OPD, and the community simply returns that violence uh, with lack of, cer- the, the, you know, because no services are provided them to show them an alternate direction. Yeah, I mean, somebody, I think Joshua Holland, who is out of Oakland and writes for Alternate, made that point that, you know, what if they took the money that they're using for these raids and put them into giving you guys the money to give people services, you know, think about what they're can be done. Down school. They're closing down five schools uh, in the coming, in the coming year. And they're, they're doing so because they say they don't need, they don't have $2 million. Well, they've already spent, they've already spent well over $2 million breaking up Occupy Oakland. Uh, and all that money could have been used to keep those schools open. Instead, less kids are going to get a quality education in Oakland. And uh, OPD is going to be hiring 25 more officers. It doesn't really make sense to me. Um, it doesn't really make sense to a lot of people. Uh, well, and, the- just, and just the fact that, that 
they're spending $2 million to come bust up a kitchen that's feeding 10,000 people. I mean, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a place that's trying to feed people, that's trying to address the mental health issues, that's trying to confront the problems that our society is creating and to actually deal with these people as human beings. All we wanted was for our city council and our, and our city government to come and participate and to come and talk with us. Um, to come, we went and talked with them. We, we went to their city council meetings. We spoke up. Uh, there were lots of people that went and talked and, and made their views clear. We wanted them to come out and relate to us. We wanted them to come out and see what we were doing and feel the good and, and feel what we were doing. Uh, and they never really chose to do so. Uh, you know, they could have come out with city planners, uh, and helped us organize the camp in a way that would have been, uh, according to, you know, health and safety regulations or whatnot. They could have done that. They could have assisted us, but instead they chose to spend millions of dollars breaking us up, putting people in the hospital, almost killing one veteran and, 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 you know, horribly wounding another one, uh, and putting other people in the hospital and arresting hundreds. Um, it's, it's a, it's a level of hypocrisy that, uh, it's, it's appalling. Uh, it's, it's also on the national level. Uh, you know, but, you know, you don't need to look far for the hypocrisy of government in this country. Uh, you just need to look at the local level to start, and then you can go to the state level, uh, and then you can go to the national level, and it's all there. Yeah. Yeah, so where is, are there plans to re-encamp in Oakland? I mean, obviously you couldn't tell me about specific plans, but... Well, so there's a 20, apparently there's a 24-hour, again, I haven't been able to get down there uh, since since I've been home. I've been really right. ill, but... Uh, there, you know, there's always events going on out in Oscar Grant Plaza out front of City Hall. Like there was okay. a dance party the other night uh, right. where everybody got together and celebrated. There was, a, you know, they're, they've reconstituted a 24-hour kind of vigil, I guess is what you would call it, uh, where there's always some there's always some people there, um, you know, 24 hours a day keeping up the protest. Um, but it's, you know, and there are many things going on under under the radar, but. Uh, the, the the large encampments are gone from Oakland uh, for now. Uh, every time we try to set something up somewhere, OPD comes down pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, we had something at 18th and Linden in West Oakland on a foreclosed lot. Uh, the owner initially was uh, very happy to have us there, uh, but then I guess uh, some people are saying she was coerced into not having us there, and OPD came and basically told us that we had to leave, and so and so we did. Uh, we didn't, you know, we, we thought we were there with the consent of the owner. I still believe that we were. Um, but, you know, as long as if the owner changed their mind, then then we have believed. But we will we will be doing uh, a lot of foreclosure defenses here in Oakland. Uh, right. We'll be, you know, we'll be continuing to do rallies and marches and, and uh, days of action like uh, the port shutdown, um, which if, 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 goes, if, if it goes according to plan, we'll send a... a an amazing message um, yeah. that will be unforgettable uh, and very clear. Um, these are targeted closings of the ports because large financial institutions uh, either outright own these terminals at the ports or are heavy investors. Um, and so it's it's very targeted. It's also um, in solidarity <coughs> in solidarity with the longshoremen and the truckers that in many cases aren't allowed to unionize, uh, don't have any benefits. Uh, aren't provided proper living wages. Uh, it's you know it's important to get to to get one back for them as well. Um, <coughs> and so that's kind of what this is about. And hopefully it'll go off. Hopefully it'll go off well. I think uh, many have said that if the, if violence is done against the protesters on the 12th, then the shutdowns will simply be extended. So hopefully the government, um, the government, city, local, local city, and and state and federal officials. <coughs> we'll go ahead and allow it to happen, allow it to be a 24-hour shutdown, and uh, we'll go. We'll move on, uh, having made our statement, and, and we'll continue to make more statements. But if, if they choose to come down violently on us, it, it'll only end up worse for them. Right. Okay, so you just covered a few different things. There's a National Day of Action on the foreclosures coming up December 6th. <coughs> December so that's 6th, I think. I yeah. think so, too. Yeah, December sixth. So, and are you? You'll be covering whatever Oakland's doing on that. Hopefully, if you that's feel better. 
so so that's tomorrow. Um, you know, I hope uh, I hope so. Okay. I hope so. I, I intend on being out there tomorrow. Okay. And then the twelfth is the shutdown of the ports, and you'll definitely be covering that. Correct. Um, and uh, what can people do to help people that aren't on the coast? Uh, well, if you can, if you're near the coast, come to the coast. Right. Uh, like we have people, we have people coming from all over the place, um, from all over the state of California, um, you know, from inland states as well that are going to be coming out in solidarity and support. Right. Uh, so if you can get there, if you can't, um, you know, I don't, I don't really know, you know, advertise maybe it, advertise tweet it, it uh, get on your social networks. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then if people want to, I know that you quit your job and you're doing this yeah. full time. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I've, I've technically taken a two month leave, but the way my, the, the way it works where I work, if I were to go back, I'd have pretty much no hours, um, you know, for at least for several months probably. So I wouldn't really be able to survive on that anyways. And, and with the support and help that I've gotten so far, uh, I'm confident that, uh, I will be able to do this uh, okay. for the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, I've te- I'm pretty much not going back, and so I've technically, you know, quit my job and uh, I've been doing this 100% now. So for people who want to support you, you have a donation page set up. Right, it's right on the website. They can go to oakforshow.com, um, and that's o a k f o s h o dot com, and we have a we have a uh, donation page set up. They're welcome to uh, support, and I greatly appreciate anybody that does. Yeah, and you're going to set up a transparency page so people can well, we see already set up. Going. We already set up the uh, last night. I, I typed out a transparency document on uh, Google Docs. I will be linking to that. Uh, I just you know I got out all my receipts from the LA trip. <laughs> and uh, th- three people driving to L.A. and back, it cost us $190. Yeah, that's uh, amazing. I know right. you guys were staying in some yoga studio. Right, right. Yeah. So we, <laughs> on the floor. we stayed for free on the floor of a friend's kind of yoga meditation studio. Yeah, you, know, you didn't get there until like, I don't even know when, 6 in the morning. And then there was the forever tweets of, I'm going to bed, I'm going to sleep, and didn't seem to happen. And so, well, when you're, you know, we were, we were on wood floors, and uh, I was basically sleeping on like um, meditation cushions, I guess is what you would call them, and it right. was uh, it was not a good week for my back. But uh, <laughs> in the end, uh, you know, it was totally worth it because we probably saved a bunch of money. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was that was what it's about. When when supporters donate, you know, I, I do my very best to make sure every penny is stretched as far as it will go. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. if we don't have to spend money on lodging. I'll sleep on a wood floor if that's necessary. We'll go ahead right. and do it. So um, it was you and Jatau, and who was the third? And Jatau is punk uh, boy in SF. Right. And then a, a fellow Occupy Oaklander went down. Her name is uh, Melissa, M U M U H L I S U H 13 on Twitter. Okay. And she uh, is she doing any streaming, or is she, she was just live she, tweeting? She was there. Uh, she was just there, and she she knew we were going, and I offered her a ride, and so she uh, contributed some contributed some gas money, and, oh, that's uh, very and, nice. and she was a big help throughout the weekend. Actually, she was uh, following me around and making sure I was drinking water and eating trail mix, and uh, right. <laughs> she was a, a good. She was like my own personal support group. Right, because uh, these events are really grueling. I mean, you guys go for hours and hours and hours. I mean, both, I've watched you do it, I've watched Tim Poole do it, and it is just these marathon events where it is hard to, you know, just even get hydrated and get food. And I just watched AJ doing it for uh, Occupy DC last night. Same thing, he hadn't eaten all day. He hadn't, you know. It's it's something that you really need to be prepared for, uh, and right. you learn through experience. You know, you learn through experience when you're dehydrated for the next three days after an event like that, that you really got to try your best to try and stay hydrated and, and try and keep getting nutrients into your body. And it's, it's really important. Right. Okay. Get the, the liberated Occupy LA sign. So I, oh, okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> So this is it. There it is. Very good. That's awesome. Here, let me make sure I'm getting it. Yep, very. That's great. That's great. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I just saw it hanging there, 
and the information tent or the welcome tent at Occupy LA was kind of right by the sidewalk. And so uh, I just kind of snuck in, took it down real quick, and just and just walked off with it. And I was actually I had it around my neck the rest of the night as I was reporting, and po- the police officers were looking at me kind of a little weirdly. Uh, and so I just went ahead and turned it around to the backside, and just were kind of walking it with a, with it around my neck like this. And uh, right. yeah, it was uh, you know it's kind of I I, I got something uh, to remember the experience by that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So okay. I mean, I would have ended up in a in a waste dumpster, and they would have just tossed it. Well, absolutely. And actually, that same footage that I was talking about, where you came across the tree people, was just such heartbreaking footage to watch. You walk through that camp and how devastated, you know. I mean, just such waste and such. It was a vibrant community only a few hours earlier, and they right. just and they just tore it all all to pieces. Yeah. Uh, um, it just looked I, like a tornado went through. That's exactly what it looked like. Yeah, and I know, I know, Occupy Freedom LA uh, was walking through on her stream, and she was in tears. You know, that was yeah. her community. Uh, yeah. It's very much like we felt how we felt when we were, you know, kicked out of Oakland. And uh, yeah. it's one of those things. I mean, it, it, it's a community built built and based upon social justice, and so to have it taken taken apart in such uh, violent ways. Uh, is really difficult for a lot of people to deal with. Yeah, yeah. I was really feeling like, and I, I was really feeling like, um, you know, the the tactic of physical occupation was important, and I think that it was. But Mike Consul actually just posted something today where he showed that, you know, all social movements, and he looked at the civil rights movements, have had to move through tactics, right? Like sure. you, you adopt a tactic and it is going to be countered and then you have to go to new tactics. And I actually think that that's the, really the great strength of what we're doing is that because of the horizontal nature, people are freed up to try a variety of tactics. And so we kind of have no shortage of tactics. It really unleashes people's creativity. And then you can see what works and what gets traction. And, you know, because it's not coming from top down, because it's not hierarchical. So I'm feeling a little bit better about, like, the Occupy Homes and the port shutdowns that are going on and the new tactics and how this is evolving. And less... Go on. Yeah, I mean... um... Because of all the good that we were able to do uh, as far at Occupy Oakland and with our Occupy, you know, with our Occupy structure here, it's, you know, I would still like to see one, see it be able to reemerge. Yeah. Uh, and I think in some ways it will. Uh, it can't really be discussed at, at the current time, right. but right. I think, uh, I think um, in many ways that's coming. Um, and in many ways, many of the services that we were providing, we will provide again. Um, right. But yeah, it, it, I don't think it'll be uh, in the open public spaces that that it was before, and um, you know that is disappointing. Uh, I think um, the mayors and and uh, the city councils, especially like here in Oakland, um, they want to pretend like they're doing something to address the issues of of the homeless epidemic. Uh, they they like to pretend and tell voters that they're doing something, but when we throw the problem on their doorstep. All of a sudden, uh, they need to deal. They need to. They need to do something. Either get rid of it, uh, or s- s- sweep it back under the rug, uh, because uh, it's not a good thing for them politically to show everybody exactly how many homeless people and the and the depth and scope of the problem that we face uh, that's in front of them. Right, and that's exactly right. So I should wrap up. We're getting long, but um, is there anything you wanted to add before we wrap up? Just uh, you know, if you're if you have a uh, you know on my side of the things on the on the citizen journalism side of the things, if you have a smartphone, um, even if you don't have a smartphone, if you only have a phone with camera capability, never stop taking pictures, never stop posting. Uh, if you have a smartphone, download the UStream app. Uh, even if there's only one or two viewers, it's one or two more people that are educated on the issues, and you never know what you'll stumble across. You never know what you'll end up recording that might change people's lives uh, or influence a discussion or uh, shed light upon a situation that otherwise would uh, would be kept in the dark. 
Um, and so, yeah, download the Ustream app, make it happen. Um, you are the citizen journalist you've been waiting for is essentially uh, my message to everybody. Um, you know, we didn't invent this. This has been going on for a long time, citizen journalism. Uh, it just so happens that with technology, uh, it becomes it becomes more more capable and readily available for everyone. Um, so I encourage everybody to be citizen journalists as well as activists and whatever they do. It does even if it's not Occupy. You know, if you just go out to uh, to cover an event of any kind, be a citizen journalist, report on it. Somebody will find value in it. Yeah, that's a great message. I have been really blown away. Like when I first kind of heard, uh, you know, they made a really big thing about the so how social media has influenced the Arab Spring and these types of things. And I was kind of, you know, it sounded nice, but I didn't have any impact with it until I watched the stream and the Twitter feed on the Brooklyn Bridge arrests. And it was incredible to watch it happen and how how you are there, the experience is. If you're following numerous people on Twitter and watching the feed at the same time, it's a really intense experience. I mean, and it really is a different experience than even watching it on YouTube. You know, watching it, because you know you're going to, you know what you're going to see. But when you're watching it unfold and you have no idea what the events are going to be, it's a really incredible experience. It's yeah. real. It's yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stop recording, and then I wanted to talk to you really briefly. Um, okay. But thank you very much for agreeing to talk with us, and yeah. it's been a great interview. Right on.